thank you, Fernando, for that very kind introduction. So thank you, everyone, for joining this session. Today, I am very, very proud to be moderating the second plenary with esteemed uh, youth leaders um, that's working on multiple aspects, particularly on communicati science, communicating science. So um, we are living in the age of infodemics, where information can be both beneficial and also overwhelming at the same time. Information access has a power to create polarity in many issues such as COVID that we're currently facing right now. It may get people to be cautious and also some become anti-vaccine. So likewise for climate change, where some can be an advocate while another group can be a total denier. But science never lies. It's just the way we design scientific messages make some information being misinterpreted or rather some being ignored. So today's session, we are going to describe how do we want to make science more interesting to young Asian. Is it through another fun TikTok videos or maybe another Netflix series? So today, the panel will discover the secret of successful young scientists communicators. So panelists today will include young journalists, youth experts, young scientists, and also climate change advocates. These young panelists today are invited to share their insights on how to creatively communicate the urgency of science-related issues, especially to the young audience. So this session will be very exciting and engaging. So don't be too serious. So these two are the qualities of young people can easily deliver. So today I would like to um, explain briefly bef uh, about our session today. So our session today will have uh, four panelists and the moderate, uh, sorry, I will actually introduce all the panelists at the session and each panelist will be given a maximum time of 10 minutes to present their presentation. And I will give um, a one minute cue before the, uh, the time is up. If you have any question throughout the presentation, please use the chat box function and please put your name, affiliation, and name of the panelists whom you, you want to address a question. And also try to become, uh, try to be brief and ask a direct question. So to, without further ado, I would like to invite our, uh, our first panel for today. So Mr. Jeff Kanoy. So he's actually a journalist for ABS CBN News in the Philippines. His coverage focuses on conflicts, disasters, and public safety. His work in the last decade has received recognition both locally and internationally. His documentary on siege of Marawi City by an ISIS-linked terror group won the, world, the Gold World Medal at 2018 New York Festivals and the Gold Dolphin for the best documentary in Cannes. In 2020, his documentary on persons with different needs, filmed entirely on camera phones, won the Bronze World Medal at 2020 New York festivals. He's also a Palanca award-winning writer, a Marshall McLuhan Fellow for Journalism, and received a citation from the Society of Publishers in Asia Awards for explanatory reporting in Hong Kong. He received professional training from Columbia University in New York, the Lauder School of Government in Tel Aviv, and the Malaysian Press Institute in Kuala Lumpur. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication at Ateneo de Manila University. In addition to his reportorial work, he currently anchors ABS-CBN morning news show Sakto. So the floor is yours, Mr. Jai. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. I hope everyone's safe in their homes. Uh, this is a very weird conference this year, I think, uh, with everyone in their homes, probably not wearing pants <laughs> for uh, this evening. Um, today, I was tasked to give you a short talk, a 10-minute talk on science communication, and I called it How to Survive the Apocalypse. So just uh, next slide, please, just to give you a uh, brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So I'll just briefly introduce what I do and, and what I cover, um, and then the relationship between journalism and science. Um, and uh, I'll move into talking about disasters, which is uh, something that I've extensively covered in the last 15 years, um, communicating science and 
Uh, of course, I'll be talking about the infodemic, which uh, Daniel mentioned briefly uh, earlier. And then finally, I'll get to how to survive the apocalypse. Next slide, please. So I'm Jeff. I've covered everything from uh, landslides, volcanic eruption, super typhoons, mudslides, you name it. I've probably covered the natural calamity to a point that when I cover and when I go to different places and cover and um, some people recognize me, they think I'm a sign of the apocalypse or something. Like if I'm there, even just for a holiday, people think that something's gonna, something bad is going to happen uh, in their area. But it's something that I've um, really enjoyed uh, covering. And I also find it very important and critical, especially in, in delivering uh, timely and accurate information. Next slide, please. So when you talk about journalism, you know, when I first uh, started with journalism, I always thought it was about, you know, writing and there was a sense of art in it because you get to write and pick the words and pick the quotes that you're going to use. But over the years, I've learned to develop that, you know, journalism is science. So th uh, this is a bunch of words that, you know, that popped up when a group of students were asked in uh, at University of Hong Kong, what they thought journalists uh, do. So they said, you know, they investigate, they gather, they write, they work, they collect and all these things. But there was one missing word that I feel like is the most important part of journalism and why journalism itself is a scientific process. Next slide, please. And that word that they missed out on is verify because at the end of the day, journalism is timely information of some public interest that is shared and is subject to a journalistic process of verification uh, for which an independent individual or organization is directly accountable. So, you know, when we did science experiments back in elementary school, you know, we always start with a problem, which is exactly what journalists face every day. We have a problem. What's our story? And then we start to gather data and evidence and then we verify it. And then we come up with conclusions, which is exactly at the basic core of everything that you all do in science. It's a scientific process. Uh, in Columbia University even, the master's degree for journalism is called Master of Science because it is a process. And if you don't follow the process, then that's the problem with disinformation, uh, which we'll be tackling later. Next slide, please. So, uh, and I'd like to, uh, you guys to keep in mind the three uh, important tenets of what I do, which is uh, the next slide, verification, independence, and accountability. So obviously there's been a lot of um, name calling and discrediting of journalists in the past uh, few years across the world. Um, everyone saying that, you know, we're biased, that we don't really uh, pursue the truth. Um, but Ultimately, what journalists believe in is a provisional truth, uh, exactly what scientists also believe in. Uh, scientific truth, obviously, is a statement of probability proportional to the evidence. Uh, journalists don't believe in absolute truth because as we gather more evidence, as more data comes in, as more of the story unfolds over the next few days, the truth can change, you know? When we started, and this pandemic, the first advice from the World Health Organization is that the public uh, doesn't need to use face masks and should be reserved for um, health professionals. But as we learned more, as more data was gathered, it became mandatory for everyone to wear face masks to prevent the virus from um, proliferating. So essentially, next slide please, uh, what, we had, what journalistic truth is and we try to pursue in every story that we do specifically and especially for science journalism is it's the best obtainable version of the truth based on verified facts up to the point of publication. So it's a continuing journey and that the news audience uh, need to follow it over, uh, uh, over time. I mean, it's not uh, one story isn't just over uh, after it airs, it continues and it continues until we get to really gather more evidence and find out the best truth uh, to come out of the data. So why is this important in the context uh, of the Philippines? Uh, next slide, please. So if I'm a sign of the apocalypse, the Philippines is really a place 
of absolute um, natural disasters. Um, it's strange when I talk to journalists from other countries, you know, they often cover um, uh, different things. Uh, maybe once in a blue moon, they get to cover a natural disaster. Here in the Philippines, we pretty much cover it on a monthly, sometimes weekly uh, basis. Why? Uh, next slide, please. So first off, we are part of what you call the typhoon belt. So we have an average of 20 typhoons in the year. Some of the world's most powerful storms in history have hit the Philippines just in the last 10 years. Um, last year, we had Typhoon uh, Ulysses in 2013. I'm sure you're familiar with Haiyan, or its local name, uh, Yolanda. Uh, one of the world's most powerful storms on record um, hit the city of Tacloban. So next slide, please. So I've, I've spent a lot of time covering um, um, these disasters. And the thing that I've always, uh, the common denominator for all of the disasters is that it was preventable if more people knew uh, what the hazards were and what the dangers were uh, in that area. And if there was more government in, uh, intervention um, in terms of preparing them and mitigating the effects of the disasters. And I'd like to, uh, next slide, please go to uh, the story of Haiyan in Yolanda. So in Central Philippines in 2013, uh, one of the world's, again, world's most powerful typhoon hit the city of Tacloban. I was there. Um, and days leading up to it, everyone kept talking about, even the scientists and the experts and the meteorologists were talking about the possibility of a storm surge. And they were talking about the storm surge. Um, they were showing data, and this is what happens. You know, but there were so many discussions at the end of the day. What happened was the people on the ground didn't really know what the hell a storm surge was. I mean, they knew that the waves were going to get big, but they didn't know that it was going to be that fast and that massive uh, on that scale. And then when I was there on the ground and people were telling me, you know, they should have just described it like a tsunami because that's what it felt like. And that was a big learning um, moment for a lot of newsrooms in the Philippines. You know, we should explain all these terms that we sort of just throw around and people don't really understand uh, the scientific terms that meteorologists use. Um, next slide, please. So, I mean, that's a challenge, especially if you want to keep people safe. Um, and then when you give them information, you talk about storm surges, the shear lines, tail end of the cold front, that people should expect, you know, effects from the intertropical convergence zone. I mean, English speakers and people who are familiar with science can probably understand it. But if you go to small communities, they have no idea what you're talking about. You can say, we, you can talk about the temperature, for example. You can say that, you know, it's quite hot and the temperature is at, you know, 35, 30, 60 degrees outside. But, if, but you have to also explain to them what heat index is, which means that, you know, this is the temperature, but this is what it will feel like when you go out. Because, and then... Um, and in those things, it, it helps prevent, you know, um, it helps prevent uh, people from succumbing to, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, emergencies that could, you know, prove to be fatal. So that's something that we kept in mind uh, moving forward in terms of um, making sure that the analyses and the forecasts from our weather agencies, uh, we have to make sure that the people understand what they're talking about. Next slide, please. So aside from the typhoon belt, we are also the home to 300 volcanoes, 20 of which, uh, 22 of which are uh, active volcanoes. So when we cover volcanoes, this is another tricky one because people, again, don't understand when you talk about pyroclastic flow, for example. Um, you can easily just say, you know, be careful of pyroclastic flow, but people don't understand what pyroclastic flow is. And the weird thing in the Philippines is we don't even have a word uh, for pyroclastic flow in the local language because it's not something, science isn't something that's built into the culture, but we don't even have terms for some things that, are, that normally happen when volcanoes happen. So one way to address this is we really did an information campaign um, and I'll be playing a short video. We did this video in several languages. Uh, I'll be showing you the English version. I was, um, uh, I asked the help of uh, our uh, head, the director of the University of the Philippines Resiliency Institute, uh, Professor Mahar Lagmay, 
uh, to help us discuss and really break down the scientific terms just to warn people of the possible effects of a volcanic eruption. So I'll show you the quick video. You've probably read or heard many things about the Taal volcano after it erupted last January 12th. And there might have been some scientific terms that weren't easy to digest, but it's important to understand them as the Taal volcano is considered one of the deadliest in the world. The Taal volcano is located on an island 60 kilometers south of Manila. There's a lake in its main crater and it's also surrounded by water. And this lake within a lake is the main attraction for many tourists. We have with us University of the Philippines Resilience Institute Executive Director and Geologist Professor Mahar Lagmay to explain what happened during the January 12 eruption of Taal. Professor Mahar? In simple terms, there are three basic kinds of eruptions. The first is what is called a phreatic explosion or steam-driven eruption, which means that the volcano spewed ash and steam. The magma or molten rocks underneath the volcano slowly moves up but doesn't reach the mouth or crater of the volcano. But it's Thank enough you. to release hot uh, so fluids that will cause steam uh, to form. video that we did, we did different versions of it in different languages, just so people could understand. We have many languages here in the Philippines, um, but we really wanted to explain to people what a phreatic explosion is, a magmatic explosion is, just so they would have a gauge and they would be armed more with the information and how to protect themselves and their family uh, during that type of disaster. So that was, that's natural disasters. We're uh, so used to it. Uh, but then something happened in 2020 that I'm sure everyone was just, you know, uh, shocked by it, especially the newsrooms across the world. We didn't know how to cover a pandemic. Uh, there's no, at least for our newsroom, we didn't have a playbook. How do you cover a pandemic? Do you go to hospitals? Do you put your journalists inside? Um, emergency rooms, how do you protect them? How do you carry cameras inside? How do you disinfect equipment? Uh, what's the time of quarantine for journalists going in there? Or should we even send them? So those are the questions that we were confronted when the first case of the coronavirus arrived in the Philippines and we had our first surge. Um, but the thing is, uh, over, over time, we, we sort of learned as we went along the report reporters in our stable, even the political ones, even the financial reporters, at one point became science communicators because we were all living in a pandemic and we had to convey as much information as we can about the virus. But the problem, uh, another uh, challenge that we also faced, and this was what Daniel mentioned earlier, is just the info deck. Next slide, please. Which the World Health Organization uh, described as the first uh, it basically uh, mines the global response and jeopardizes measures to control the pandemic. And I'm sure you've heard a lot of disinformation. I don't even like calling it fake news because I think fake news is quite ironic as a term. Uh, news is supposed to be the truth and you can't have fake truth. So I call it disinformation. And there's, there was so much disinformation going around, which caused a lot of panic uh, here in the Philippines and I'm sure in other parts of the world. Um, and it's not just on social media, it's on messenger groups. I'm sure you had relatives, you know, sharing, uh, sharing things on WhatsApp or on Viber about, uh, you know, misinformation. Um, and the thing that we, we realized is that, you know, misinformation at this point, it, it could cost lives. And it's trickier when we actually hear that misinformation coming from actual leaders. I mean, in the US, you had Donald Trump saying, you know, you could uh, eat a banana to, I think, to, to help cure COVID or protect yourself from COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Here in the Philippines, our own president said that, you know, to clean your mask, you can use petrol or gasoline. Um, and then we also have leaders who distributed uh, ivermectin uh, as, you know, a way to uh, quote unquote, protect yourself or cure yourself from, from COVID. Um, and these are actual leaders. I mean, I mean, if you have people following these leaders and following their chain of thought, you know, it's it really good cost lives. So it became more of a, a challenge for us to not just cope ourselves with, with how to, how do we report COVID, but as well as fight um, the information that are coming from supposedly official uh, sources. So how did we do that? 
um, again, we really had to deal with, um, we really had to go back to basics and we had to go back to, to the science of it, even if it, it goes against official channels. Um, so it's commonsensical to not, you know, wash your face masks with gasoline, but you really had to explain it well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, I don't have any more time, but that's a bit of a video. Of, uh, we also did a video on the coronavirus. We explained how they can protect themselves, what the virus is. We used a lot of graphics to make people understand. It's more visual rather than someone just talking. Uh, next slide, please. And other journalists from across different newsrooms went to TikTok, for example. This is an actual pharmacist well, going to ano TikTok. Ba ivermectin? Um, talking about what ivermectin is, that it's really for animals and that there's not enough evidence yet to support that it can help in, in preventing COVID. Uh, next slide, please. We also went to a lot of social media channels hoping that the youth can actually learn stuff isang through isang music, isang through jokes, na through na memes. Na uh, by, by doing that information and hope, hoping that the youth can actually tap their relatives and older relatives and their communities to, to spread that information. Next slide, so just to wrap up, how to survive an apocalypse? Well, science is your best friend. <laughs> I mean, it's not, science won't lie to you. Whatever the data is, that's what you should follow. The problem is you should learn how to communicate it. Um, it's very important, you know, you can have the biggest breakthrough in the world inside the laboratory but if it doesn't reach the intended audience then what's that breakthrough for what's that information for and we're here as journalists to help uh, distill that information to make sure that more people uh, understand it next slide please so how do you do it you make it simple you make it accessible as we did in different uh, videos we we talked in the language that people would talk, whether it's a native language or how young people would talk, we use that same language. You don't have to quote unquote dummify science for people to understand it. Just have to make it more simple and more palatable for a lot of people by comparing it to things that they already know and that already exists. Um, and again, we do a lot of videos to do that um, because like any good video, uh, you're hooked if there is motion and emotion in those videos and you tell your stories and the science information through motion and emotion because it's really what affects people. Because, and last slide, at the end of the day, people won't remember numbers and people won't remember figures. But if you tell them stories, uh, if you tell them something powerful enough that they find an attachment to it, they will remember it. Because the mind forgets, but the heart often remembers. Thank you very much and looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Jeff. That's such an amazing sharing. I wish we have more time to listen to your stories, but we're not, we're gonna have a discussion after this. So let's move on to the next panelist we have today. So um, I have a dear friend of mine, Dr. Meng Wang uh, is a senior ge geologist at the Chinese Academy of Science, uh, CAS and a president of Young Earth Scientists, YES Network, which is an international scientific organization with more than 5,000 members uh, of young and early career earth scientists. He was nominated as executive secretary of World Youth Scientist Summit, WISS, in 2019, which led to the young generation of scientists to dialogue with senior scientists, entrepreneurs, and innovators with strong support from the government, industries and scientific communities. He is currently leading several national and international scientific research projects on climate, environment, and also industry. Meng started his career in the Ministry of Land and Resources in China in policy counseling and management and transferred to China Min Metals Group, which is a world leading company in mining industry, and then back to the CAS in 2017. This has given him a very good experience with the government, industry, and science. Dr. Meng is also um, the Asia Pacific Chair for the Youth UNESCO Climate Action Network. So the floor is yours, Meng. Thank you for the introduction from Daniel. Uh, I'm really happy we have a very interesting uh, presentation from Jeff. Uh, he also mentioned the geologist. <laughs> I'm a geologist, so I will. Uh, make the uh, how to scientific art for the public and how to for the for the scientists uh, to working with uh, with the with the public and also with the media uh, 
uh, also I give some case from uh, my uh, my work. I already have the introduction from the Daniel for myself, so I will not do uh, another introduction. So firstly, maybe uh, I want to show what is the geologist. So what we are doing and can we make a better world? And some friends maybe think we are very cool job and we are looking for the mining resources. Uh, some friends think it's very cool. So it's a with a very beautiful rock and a very beautiful landscape. Uh, so you see, but my my mom always think we are very, very dangerous job, of course. Uh, sometimes I even think we can go to another planet like the Mars, like we can do very, very uh, more, more uh, cool job. But professors always think we are very naive, of course, only the selfie in the, in the field work. In fact, we are only take the beer, this is a job. Of course, uh, what's the real work for the geologist? The geologist is working for the uh, using the earth science, earth science for the for the uh, society and for the. And also, we are contribute several goals from the SDGs. Uh, this is a map for our working for the for the global, and we are trying to make a, a, a hyper hero, a hyper hero for the for the world to uh, to service for the societies. This is a. Uh, some picture from myself. So this is uh, some uh, very uh, funny introduction about my work. So how the science to work with uh, with uh, to work and how we are linked with uh, with artists and with art. So for the art uh, for the scientists, uh, uh, J for science, we are looking for the evidence for the nature, and we there's no absolutely uh, uh, absolutely uh, um, truth. So we are trying. We are trying to looking for more uh, evidence and also to make a whole picture for the for the for the for the truth. And we are trying to find more and more correct, make, make it more and more correct. Of course, we need the people to work together with us because we are more like uh, some people. We think we are more nerds, so we need some some people to make the painting for us. So the whole picture. So th these people may be the artists. Uh, so we did. Uh, so I will give uh, one case. We are doing how we worked with uh, with artists uh, for the for the sites. This is uh, one painting from my friend. He's an artist. It's a painting uh, for the uh, eighty million years ago for the Shandong Province, the east part of China. This is a land with a dinosaur. And uh, uh, so, what is the image for you for the dinosaurs? Maybe different people have different uh, image for that. So maybe uh, even some people think dinosaurs come from another part of the world. So how for the scientists and how for the artists to working together to rebuild the, the dinosaurs. So uh, this is a picture, uh, rebuilding picture for the T-Rex. Uh, everyone know, 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 know him, he's a very, very famous uh, dinosaur. So in fact, uh, as very, very beginning, we found uh, fossils like this and we are rebuilding by the computer, computer by the pictures. And we are make the picture of a different part of the of the of the teach. Uh, so uh, finally, we say uh, what kind of and we also looking for some um, uh, uh, information from the uh, animals uh, live right now. So like the uh, like different animals. So we can know they have the different part of the how to they close the moss. And we found oh maybe this is a truth and this is a. Uh, this is not true, but in fact, uh, we uh, we are looking for another kind of uh, life, the crocodiles, and we just found okay, some alive the animal also have the how have the tooth out of the mouth. So uh, we so this we using this way to rebuild the the dinosaurs and how we rebuild the skins. Maybe uh, there, there's no one to find the skin of the dinosaur uh, uh, left right now, but we found many many. Uh, impressions for sales uh, uh, in the, for the for the dinosaurs. So we use this uh, impressions that for sale to rebuild the uh, the skin of the dinosaurs. So this is a very very cool for sales uh, we found in the Alberta, Canada in 2011, and it's almost a perfect uh, protected for the fossils. So we can very clearly to know the structures of the skin of the of this dinosaur. Uh, so we rebuilt the dinosaur in this way. So how about the color? So we are looking for the how we can rebuild the dinosaur with the color. So we also we need to find the, some evidence from the from the bird right now, and you, we know the structure 
how why the color in the in the bird is from the uh, mechanism. So we are using the uh, comparing drop from the fossil of the of the uh, feather um, uh, feathers fossil and to looking for the structures very very small structures of the fossil and to know the different structure uh, uh, mechanism have the different colors. So we are comparing the uh, the modern uh, birds so we can know the different colors. Uh, for the for the for the for the dinosaur's uh, skin and uh, so we make the first uh, color photographer for the dinosaur maybe the uh, the the medias and the jewelers uh, make the make the photos by our camera but we also make the photo uh, for the for the dinosaur so this is very interesting job and this is a very very already very beautiful you can see we we learn from the birds and we review the dinosaur in this way uh, so we make the whole picture with uh, by each uh, animals is uh, dinosaurs. So this is uh, our uh, job from the science to working with the uh, with the uh, with the media with the artists. So uh, how the uh, the how to, how the scientists to show the voice. So the first thing for basically thing for us, I think we need to tell the truth. So uh, of course we are looking for different way to tell the truth to the public. Uh, the first dialogue between Einstein and the Tiger is that. Uh, if there's no human beings, so the, the beauty is not exist. And the tiger said, yes. So it means the only the, the peoples uh, uh, so know the, um, uh, what is the real meaning for the beauties. But for the scientists, uh, for us, for the human beings, we always think about where I come from and where we need to go in the futures. So as a very, very uh, traditional in the history, and we already have who tell us the truth as the beginning of the universe and who is uh, who will measure the size of the space and how there is the sun and the moon and the various stars uh, live. So this is so many questions from the human beings at the very beginning and we can know from very, very old heritage and they are already trying to understand the science uh, in that time. So for the modern time, and we are trying to go to the Mars and we are um, uh, send out a plane and we want to go to the uh, other planet. So this is our work and how, and this is a very cool job. And I think it's very attractive for the public and everyone is, uh, is, is interesting in this, uh, in this topic, like the uh, SpaceX, like the uh, Tesla. So I think the civilizations come from the exploration in nature. So uh, this is uh, uh, some um, work from the scientists and we want to deliver to the public. Of course, we are also facing the challenging. We are not always having the good story. We are also having the dangers to the public. This is a, this is a very emergency for the future. So only we give the solution for the future. This is uh, more important for us. So we are facing the challenging climate change and uh, the um, uh, misunderstandings and also the dark side of the uh, digitals and also the COVID-19. Uh, for the artists, we always say, uh, for the geologists, we are always say we are the half artists because we need to do the painting, we need to do the uh, collection of the rocks and the fossils. And we send, also send up the geo art groups. Uh, uh, we have some exhibitions for the art and also linked with the emergency issues, emergency topics uh, in the different parts of the world about the uh, digital science, about the climate. Also, we have the interworld review is a dialogue between the scientists, the entrepreneurs, and also the artists. Uh, we publish the books. A lot of the books uh, together with the scientists, uh, with, uh, with the artists uh, to make the uh, make, uh, make for the public, and we also have the exhibition. So for the social media and the traditional media, uh, you know, as a scientist, uh, we are all, always a little bit scary in how we can collaborate with the with the, with the media, especially the social media, because it's really freedom, and everyone can be a safe media to the public. So we want to deliver the truth, but we are always think a little bit lonely during this very, very crowded social media world. So this is a, a, our a confusing time. So we really want to, I'm very happy to invite by Amik uh, to, uh, to talk here and to collaborate with you to understanding better. For the emergency issues, I really want to talk really one topic is climate. For the climate, uh, UNESCO signed up the Young Climate Action uh, Network. This is uh, uh, not only the voice, but we need to make the actions and we get attention 
from very high level people. We stand up the staring communities. We have the 15 persons from different parts of the world. And this is a, a, a short video from, from us. The climate is the most urgent issues for all human beings. So for two years now we are we have been working toward the implementation of the project, how UNESCO through its key thematic in terms of education, sciences, culture, communication and information could support and strengthen youth climate action around the world. There are over 11,500 ASPNET member schools in 182 countries. The African Youth Climate Hub has been present through these couple of days at COP26 and participated and organized several events. Mainly towards climate education, we've been able to engage and mobilize and dialogue with several participants. Disasters disproportionately affect persons living in poverty and so many other vulnerable groups. We work with community leaders, youth leaders, climate experts, researchers to increase preparedness and resilience against future disaster that is going to happen in this population or in this area. And this is something that told me that when we talk about climate change, we must bear an open mind. And uh, over 700 children in creative upcycling using waste as well as um, climate change education. And during the first class auto part last year, uh, we, we just make a mapping of um, youth projects in the in the domain of water, and uh, we selected three three best projects. So there's one project who is about refining water with moringa seed. The second one is about finding a drinkable water with a specific machine, and that one concerned blind people. We hope our collective work will not only help empowering young people in the region and also bring up their ideas for climate solutions. Change the man, not climate. So this is uh, some uh, inter very short introduction about the UK and also the uh, the support audition for the for the AMIC uh, this time, this meeting and uh, uh, for the scientists, I'm very, very happy to invite in uh, to join this very interesting uh, meeting and to dialogue with all the media because we always want to collaborate with a more, uh, more better way to the to the to the public and to working with the, with the jurists. I'm very happy we have the Jeff uh, before me and uh, he made a very interesting uh, presentation and uh, more better than me. Uh, so uh, for me and I think the. Uh, I'm uh, very, uh, I'm a young scientist, so we always say, what's a unit us in this group? No matter um, uh, you can or other groups, also the AMIC, I think it's the love for the sciences. That's all, nothing more, nothing less. Of course, the friendship is very, very important. Only the friendship, the world will be at peace. So thank you for the invitation again, and I'm looking for more dialogue with all of you. Finally, I want to say happy birthday to AMIC, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, man. That is such an interesting, you know, presentation. And I have never been more interested in learning about dinosaurs more than today. So let's move to the next panelist. Um, so the next one, we have Miss Nina Trang Nguyen. So Nina Trang Nguyen is a British government chauvinist scholar with master degree in multimedia journalism. She has an almost 10 year work experience, including a nine year stint at Vietnam National Te Television, VTV. She has contributed to both international and national journalism events and projects, and also built up her own identity as creative producer, storyteller, and multimedia journalist. In 2019, Ms. Trang was the first woman field reporter to cover the South Sudan Civil War. Her stories included Vietnam's first field hospital and the life of Vietnamese peacekeepers serving the United Nations peacekeeping mission. Among her numerous awards are the Vietnam National Press Award in 2017 and top five best TV hosts in BTV Awards in 2018. In 2014, Ms. Trang was among the 29 Vietnamese youth ambassadors who took part in the 41st ship for South East Asian and Japanese youth program. She is currently a guest lecturer at the Academy of Journalism and Communication. 
She also works as strategy designer, a user interface researcher, a design thinking facilitator for Doodle Design. So the floor is yours, McNina. Nina, I think your your mic is mute. Oh, it's familiar in this in this time during this time using Zoom a lot of time. We have to unmute yourself, right? Thank you so much for your very long introduction, <laughs> and um, uh, I have to say thank you to my previous um, colleagues, um, the presenter, very um, wonderful presenter. They have um, given us a lot of information and also interesting way to communicate science. And for Mr. Wang, uh, I, I I'm so surprised that you are a geologist because um, it sounds like with your presentation, it sounds like you have the quite an artist so <laughs> we have a lot of artists piece um, in in your presentation and um i really like the last quotes of your uh, presentation change your mind uh, not change the climate and um, with my presentation today i also want to um uh, to give you or to spread the quotes that change your mind uh, don't change the science um, so um, I'm so uh, I'm so happy to be here today to talk with all of you, and um, I will share my screen now. Okay. So you can see my screen now, right? Okay, so our topic is to communicate science. Um, actually, this is not the question uh, that I was given only for this um, conference to answer for or to discuss with you guys. Actually, this is the question that I have to ask myself in a daily routine. So uh, in the very long introduction that the moderator have given us about me, actually, I have a little bit change in, in my um, my job now. And um, I want to share with you, it's really fits this talk today. So that's what I want to share with you, because now I'm working as the communication and marketing senior manager of the Vin Future Foundation and directly manage the Vin Future Prize Actually, this is the Global Science and Technology Prize for Humanity from Vietnam. And the prize pledged an amount of 4.5 million US, million US dollars in total for breaking through research idea and technology innovation. And if you never heard about this, perfect timing. Please browse binfuture.org for more information. Okay, we'll get back to the topic today. Uh, how do we make uh, the science more interesting? So I'm working with scientists every day and I am communicating with science every uh, minute. But I don't think I have found the perfect answer for that question yet. And I hope that we can figure it out today somehow in this session. First, what people think of science. Maybe you can uh, type some word quickly in the chat, chat box to share with me what you think about science. But uh, here I have some uh, images that can be the answer. Science with people, maybe the image of um, scientists staying in the labs for all day long, for their whole lives maybe. And maybe uh, that will be the image of a lot of uh, very complicated uh, machine that even if someone tried to explain, I'm wondering, I can understand or not how they work, right? And what else? Oops, I think this is cool actually, but uh, <laughs> but this is science in, in the eyes, in the lens of um, normal people, right? Uh, so I, I, I want to share with you because um, sometimes uh, we, we think that science is boring. Sometimes we think that science just relate to scientists and just relate to machine, but um, that's the problem of communication when communicating with people about science and so what's wrong with the, the scientific communication that we are having now uh, in the world first i think the um, scientists they love scientific terms but normal people i think they hate them um, for example big words hard to pronounce word too complicated words they are all burdened to stop people from coming to get close to science, you think? And um, imagine, I just give you a very um, simple um, 
uh, uh, um, example, like a daisy in the uh, scientific um, terms, it's, it's called, I have to write down because I cannot remember it, Bellis Berenice. See, it sounds like a spell in Harry Potter movie. Um, the truth is, no matter how crazy I love Harry Potter, I have never remembered any spell in the series. So the uh, scientific terms, they sound boring. And that, that's why people sometimes think about science as the boring things. The second one, we always afraid of uh, uh, giving too, le too little information. And uh, that uh, leads to the, the situation of having too much information for the, the audience. This is what I have to face every day. For example, I have to post a Facebook page uh, for, for my Facebook page, a post about science. At first I think, oh, it's too short. Uh, people might not understand. And then I write, write down more and more and more. And then, oh my God, it's, it's too long. No, people are not going to be patient enough to read it. So the problem is that I always have that hesitation when I have to write something about science. Remember, complex definition happen all at the same time will cause chaos and the process of collecting information may turn you know, frustrating. And uh, keep this in mind, even if you are the one who write things or the one who read, you don't have to know all, the, all at once. Break the information in bite-sized portion will help you to digest things more easily day by day. And I think that's the, the, the lesson that I have learned with uh, giving information about science to people. Uh, the last thing about the wrong thing we are doing with science communication the prejudice inside yourself i've told you i was surprised when i think mr wong here is the geologist because uh he taught everything so in, in a very artist way but i was wrong science scientists can be artists too right so that's the prejudice in my in in my mind that i have to change right now i have to change it so the prejudice towards science need to be changed because you always think about how boring the science is how bad it treated you in uh when you are when you're still at school right you're afraid of that subject it treated me bad so i hate it but no um have you ever thought that science is very close to you and it's really useful for every bit of your daily life. For example, I'm having the light to talk to you uh, thanks to Edison's light bulb invention. That's a very big name, but the thing that he, he gave us is very small thing that we use every day, change the life of millions of people, that's science, right? So science is interesting. And if you didn't know it, I have to affirm one more time that science is very interesting. I, uh, for, I have an, a video for you to watch, but I have to check if, if it's can. Can you hear it? Can you hear? Oh, okay, great. Pretty soon that plane will weigh a lot less thanks to the first material on our list. It's called micro lattice. Created by Boeing, this is the lightest metal in the world. You can compare it to a human bone, rigid on the outside, mostly hollow on the inside, making it strong yet very lightweight. The entire structure was basically 99.99% air. In fact, it's a hundred times lighter than styrofoam, yet is as rigid as metal. Just look as it gently rests atop a dandelion. The hope is to use the material in airplanes, cutting down on the aircraft's weight, thus making them more okay, proficient. Okay, it's just a very Up short part of that video. It's a very um, interesting video about new materials for future. And uh, imagine that one day you will go to somewhere traveling on the, the airplane that, that lights weight, making from that kind of material. It sounds really wonderful, right? And um, that's, that's why science is very close to us. And recently I had the chance to hold a public dialogue with, um, uh, for the young people to talk to a 2010 Nobel Prize winner in physics. And uh, with his discovery of the new material called graphene, diamond is no longer the hardest substance on earth because uh, this is the new hardest substance and thinnest substance on earth. And the cool thing is he's discovered the wonder material by using only pieces of sticky tapes 
and the pencil. So uh, how they did it? Actually, uh, he um, using the tape, the 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 thick sticky tape to remove layers and layer of graphite from the lead pencil that I'm having here to um, ending up with a single layer of graphite from like uh, it's it's really thin. It's just uh, one atom thick. So um, for uh, this uh, material, we listen to it like uh, the story I've just told you. I don't think that it's interesting enough, but let's listen to the application that graphene can help us in our daily life. So we have here the drinkable ocean water. So with the graphene, uh, they, uh, it will help us to let water through it while filtering out all the salt at the same time. And to make the ocean water drinkable, it sounds unbelievable, right? And if you apply graphene into battery, you will have to, uh, you will be able to recharge your phone from empty to full battery from uh, for just 15 minutes. Uh, it's very impressive. And because graphene is super stretchy, we might end up uh, with a smartphone that can be bent like this. What do you think about your your smartphone bending like this? <laughs> and this thing, I really like it. The the um, the lamp or the light bulb you have in your your family or your in your house will be the past when you have the glowing wallpaper that can uh, give you the light just with the wallpaper. Okay, so that's the the um, example of uh, graphene, a new material for the future. Another example I want to give you is the photovoltaic window. It sounds really scientific. Photovoltaic window. It's very long and hard to remember. But uh, to make it short and simple, is the this is the window, the window frame that looks just like normal window, but it generates electricity using solar energy. So use. If you use this for your building and your building will be able to produce energy itself and uh, your building will be energy producing building and uh, net zero using the energy that that, that it, it generates okay so another this is the window another example i want to share with you I want to once again confirm that science is more than just interesting. It's essential to change the lives of millions of people. When you think of uh, electricity uh, for rural places, um, and, and uh, in, in, the, in the past, we think that we need the uh, electricity factory to have electricity. But now, thanks to the excellent scientists around the world, people in the rural area can have electricity without waiting for the whole electricity factory to be built there. Now they can use portable, affordable, lightweight, and even wearable solar modules to generate energy for their demand, as you can see in the photo. So uh, in this photo, you can see a camel having a, a box with a, a cover by, um, um, solar panel on uh, his his uh, in his back on his back. Uh, so in this image, this is the fridge. Actually, it's a fridge using solar energy from the solar panel. So it can be moved on the camel's back to pass the desert to bring. What do you think here in this fridge? Bring vaccine to people in places in Africa and in deserts. So it's really really um, the very effective. Uh, application that we can use by using a uh, solar panel here. Okay, so come back to our problem today. We have problem of communicating science. Uh, uh, and uh, here, because I uh, am I'm a journalist, so I want to share with you in, uh, the tips in reporting as a journalist. So we have a lot of tips here that you can apply for communication science, but um, I, I, want, I want to focus here in two things that are my favorite. First one is to avoid basic question in interview. You might be shooting only a short video or running fast for a deadline to, uh, for, for a newspaper. But uh, you think you will, uh, sometimes you think that you will ask quick and basic questions to make it easy. The fact is, if you want to have like a several minute edited video, you should have an hour of shooting. Uh, what, what is the reason? Because the scientists, they are not the presenter. They are not someone who know what you want to hear. 
And by the way, uh, it's a norm that scientists, they are shy. They, 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 some of, they are even introverts and not easy to, uh, to be approached at all. So what you need a patient and more patients, um, really listen to them and uh, to open layer and layer of their emotions, then you will get what you want. And when you can do that, you can get the second thing that I want to share here is the, the, uh, the idea of making scientific story human. The goal is to reach people, to reach human. So um, to reach people who don't think science is for them. Some, for someone who, who don't uh, really prefer science, but I really want to share with them. I try to do that through unusual stories and unconventional approaches. Okay, so for next thing, I have a, some of the quotes I get from uh, famous journalists from the world, the New York Times the, and the Scientific American that you can uh, read yourself. And... What about social media for communicators? Uh, here we have three uh, things. I think that there will be more uh, thing that we can do uh, with uh, communicating on social media. But um, one more thing that I, I, I want to focus here is the impact of science in uh, communicates on society. When you can share that um, the thing that I'm doing can influence a lot of people that when uh, your information or your your message works uh, here, I I want to share with you the image of the breakthrough prize. This is the technology prize, but can you see? You can see it like the Oscar of science. It's really not like other kinds of um, uh, technology and science prize awards. Here we can see a Hollywood celebrity, gorgeous suits, fabulous set sheets, and entertaining performances in this prize awards. Here, Hollywood stars and Mark Zuckerberg, right? As the founder of this, uh, this prize, actually, this foundation, Breakthrough Foundation. And uh, I want to share with you because with this... Um, uh, th this in 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 this uh, prize award, there there's one thing that I really remember uh, talking about a doctor with an achievement in medicine, uh, an, a laureate that gets win the uh, the prize. They put instead of talking a lot, they put a girl with diabetes on stage, and because this invention, this discovery uh, relating to diabetes, that girl looking so beautiful and so healthy, standing on the stage and say that I used to be a girl uh, having struggle with diabetes I, um, and serious you know, problem with diabetes. And I cannot live without uh, your invention, your discovery like that, something like that. And um, everyone was moved. Uh, I think that uh, when you can show how uh, your impact with, uh, with normal people, you, you can really uh, move people and you can change your their mind and um uh that's uh, when i uh, i want to wrap up my my uh, my presentation with one thing i think that when you can uh, touch the society with a huge impact uh, by uh firstly by changing your thought changing your mind and uh, strong enough that you can uh change other with you so i just want to share with you that message uh, quite the same message like the the previous one, Miss Mr. Kwang, right? <laughs> okay, that's uh, all I want to share with you today. Thank you so much for listening, and um, I'm happy for any question that you give me. And back to our um, uh, moderator. Thank you, Nina. Such an amazing presentation. I love how Nina and Jeff both advocating to humanize science because we rarely talk about the human level of science. We always talk about the science of science. So, which has brought us, uh, you know, just right to our final panelists today. So, we, today we have Kulsum Siddiqui. So, Ms. Kulsum Siddiqui has been the forefront of youth driven activities in Pakistan to mitigate climate change by not only engaging communities and organizations, but thousands of students. With her efforts, her university, IOBM, improved 100 points globally on the UI Green Metric Campus ranking within a year of
sustainable practices advocated for and implemented at the university for over 14,000 students. She then started to involve education institutions from across Karachi with her team of 500 members and volunteers to engage in similar youth-led initiatives and activities. Her work is recognized by the World Federation of the United Nations Association and her project centered around human rights in my country. Climate action was selected amongst 18 other projects globally. She received intensive training at the UN headquarters in Geneva to implement her project in Pakistan. She was appointed as head of youth for Pakistan by the United Nations Association of Pakistan in 2018 to set up UNAP youth chapters with over 1,000 schools, colleges, and universities in Pakistan. She structured a digital framework for young people to engage with various sustainability-related organizations and organize a plethora of events, online and also in person. And climate-related initiatives with various organizations such as WWF. Currently, she is planning and executing mock COP, so COP for students across Pakistan in collaboration with the WWF. Apart from driving changes in students and young people, she also helps organization by training them with best practices. She recently helped kick off Rankit Bankiza Sustainability Challenge for the Asia and Middle East region. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for the very lengthy introduction. <laughs> um, I'm really uh, happy to be here today with such excellent um, co-presenters. Jeff, I really, really enjoyed your presentation, especially the topic of your presentation was very appropriate <laughs> and very catchy. Uh, Wang, again, brilliant. And um, I would, I'm sure, and I'm really curious, you're probably a very talented artist while being a ge geologist. And Nina, again, I'm sure your students are really lucky because you speak so nicely. It's, it's a pleasure to hear from you. It's really good to hear from someone who's so happy to hear, listen to. Uh, I hope I can explain that correctly. Um, and finally, Daniel, thank you for you know, bringing us all together here and for having such a wonderful conference. That being said, um, uh, I think I won't present in the interest of time, but I do want to sum up everything and draw from what everything has said, everybody has said today and uh, share my experiences uh, from my part of the country and um, what I've achieved so far. Uh, so like Daniel mentioned, um, a lot of young people, you know, it started from a group of friends, basically. My story starts from my college days where just a group of friends realized, you know, it's really sad that people don't even bother throwing the wrapper within the trash can. They might just throw, shoot and miss, and they, they won't really bother. And that really bothered me. So I went up to my school management and I said, hey, can, can we fix this? Is, is there something we can do? How can we educate these 14,000 people to you know at least dispose of their trash properly? Maybe not drink plastic, uh, purchase so many plastic bottles, single use plastic bottles for water. How can we convince them that you know they should switch to glass or metal? or some, you know, reusable materials. And it's, it basically started like that. And soon enough, uh, like Daniel mentioned, it, um, and I would like to draw on what Jeff and Nina said, make it interesting, make it really, you know, do it in a very eye-catching way. So one initiative that I can recall, which was really quirky and it got so many results was what we did was we wanted to talk about plastic in the ocean. And all we did was we installed a speaker. We installed um, like cutouts of some ocean marine life across around that speaker. We put it in the center of the university and all people could hear was whale calls and sounds of polar bears. And they were so confused because, you know, imagine walking on campus and you're just hearing marine life and you're just going like, what is going on? <laughs> and that's what we did. So for, for a week, everybody on campus, you know, that hype got, uh, it, it got really hyped up because it was a very well-kept secret between our society members that we wouldn't tell anybody what this is about. 
and then everybody was so curious to that big reveal and that's exactly you know what we did we kind of um educated the people and that's where we got viral and a lot of people started coming to our newly formed facebook page our social media handles etc and you know that's where that's where we really kicked off and then from there on it was quite easy because once you get that target audience where you're always doing something in a quirky or funny way so what we did was um we made we started making small videos like jeff uh, now tiktok is really in so like jeff said you know we started making these small really hilarious tiktoks where people where students were you know just you know kind of poking at each other in fun if they weren't adopting sustainable practices so as a joke these practices actually came to um came to fruition for example we made a video where uh, a boy is throwing the trash and he misses and then he doesn't go and pick it up so his friends are just making fun of him and they're saying why are you doing that like go pick it up and they wouldn't let him go anywhere until he picked it up so we actually measured that after that we didn't see a lot of trash outside the bins and people were actually recycling and putting things in the correct bins and from there on we started a recycling and composting campaign now people really didn't know what composting was not you can't expect 14000 people to know what the science behind composting is and why it why it should even matter so what we did was we set up a garden space within the campus we set up a composting space within the campus and we kind of made this another quirky campaign and and to kind of sum it up it has to be unique it has to be fun we can't be as scientists or as sustainability enthusiasts or as communicators we can't be seen as stressed out people all the time of course these things are pertinent and they need to be addressed and when when there are severe calamities people need to be warned but at the same time um someone correctly said it's what in the you might forget the facts and figures i think it was just presentation you might forget the facts and figures but what goes in the heart stays there so you kind of have to catch that emotion and you kind of have to nail them where they where they might remember i think that that is uh, the most important thing apart from that um also engaging with young people of course we have to give them hope so science has to come with innovation and hope now what nina shared you know there's so many interesting innovations happening and there's hope for the world yes there's climate change yes things are going in the wrong direction but we have these amazing people who are bringing out these new and brilliant inventions and we have to kind of have that positivity spread around as well and kind of share share them make them viral make their innovations viral put them in a tiktok trend so on and so forth and and you know that's that's kind of how it goes there's so much awareness and i've seen this first hand from a university it went to a city and then from a city it went to a country and then from a country it became international just a couple of friends being bothered by one thing so your your science could be this much but your impact could be this much just based on how how you how passionate you are and how engaging you are and at the end of the day that is the key of communication getting hitting the people right where you know it matters and um and i think uh, i would like to end with that really because i think we are short on time and that's it from me it was really a pleasure to meet everybody and i hope to stay connected with all of you thank you Thank you, Kulsum. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining this panel. And then I am so, so sorry because we are running out of time, but we do have like a bit of question that we want to ask the panelists. Uh, but before I ask, uh, you know, some of the questions from the audience, I would just want to read one of the comments from the audience, which is really interesting. When we talk about science, we always think about scientific labs, scientists, um, but we never talk about the society the human behavior which is also science but we rarely talk about that so um that's actually the essence of this panel discussion today so let's uh let's start with jeff today uh, i have one question from may and chua 
Jeff, I know how the Philippine media was rather unprepared for a pandemic. Do you think we are we were able to get a glimpse of it when there were reports about SARS and H1N1? And were there experiences, learnings from those um, that you and your colleague got to incorporate when you did your reports during the time of COVID? So, do you, Jeff? I, yep, thank you, May, for that question and for the comment. Um, I think we, we, I mean, obviously we started out with um, all these questions and we didn't know where to draw any answers from. So the limited knowledge we did gain from the SARS and the H1N1 pandemic, although it was quite limited, it wasn't in this scale where there were lockdowns as well, where there were um, government measures in place that limited the movement of media as well. Um, so it was really, just starting what I felt like was really starting from scratch. I mean, uh, it, it was really difficult. Uh, I, 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 again, I usually cover disasters and before we would have a go bag where if there's a disaster that I need to cover, you just get your bag and then you go and then you go to that place and then you cover, which was extremely difficult during this time because you can't really just go anywhere um, if you go to a different city or a different place, you'd have to quarantine. But if you quarantine for 14 days, what are you going to be able to cover? I mean, the whole disaster would be over. So there were so many things that we sort of just learned as we went along. Um, and this is something that we, um, I mean, obviously we were, we knew that we needed to wear um, PPEs, protective personal equipment as well, when we go to hospitals to cover. But the act of actually wearing it, I didn't know that there was a procedure that you had to put on the gloves first and there's a donning and doffing process. I mean, these these things we I really just sort of learned with this pandemic rather than um, the previous um, uh, SARS and H1N1 scares that we had uh, here in the Philippines. So uh, Again, I think even up to the, today, we're still learning and we're still coping with um, the situation, especially with all the variants changing. You know, um, it's not it's it's a playbook that we're still writing at this point. Thank you, Jeff. It is indeed a challenge to be battling the invisible enemy, right? We don't know them. We can't see them. We just all that we know, we got infected. Yeah, um, so that's the challenge that we have to face in communicating science. We need to validate whatever that we want to report. So without being part of the experience, we can't validate things. So um, yeah, that's uh, moving to the next one. Uh, Meng, I have a one question with you. Um, so I've never been more interested learning about dinosaurs until today, listening to you. So can you share with us, what are the key learnings from us learning about the past era? Is there anything that we need uh, a tech, take home messages from you, from your field uh, in geology and so on? Uh, thank you for the question and also thank you for the comments. Uh, in fact, as a geologist, I'm a paleontologist. I'm working uh, using the uh, geochemical way from the the, um, the Jurassic to the Cretaceous, it's a it's a time for the for the very very uh, uh, popular time for the for the dinosaurs and also the the Andean is 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 Kingston time for the dinosaurs. So this I using the geochemical way to rebuild the paleo environment uh, paleo climate. So th we will using this one. This is a paleo environment and paleo climate as a background for the modern climate. So how we can know the changing of the climate? So we, we need the background. So we need to know the changing. So this is my job. And uh, uh, I'm using the, 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 the data to rebuild the, uh, the background for the modern climate. So this is a, a paleontologist and also the uh, sedimentologist's work. Also, this is not only the, uh, the, the, the one work for the geology. A geology, of course, they, they have more, more wider the job, for example, the, the hazard like the Jeff side, we are we have a very uh, big group of, from geologists working for the tsunami and uh, flood and uh, also other hydrologists and earthquake and other other. So we uh, we are using the uh, physical way to understanding the uh, 
uh, the activities of the planet Earth to uh, to be able the modernizing of the of the planet Earth to to tell the public the emergency issues. So this is a more like a, we are uh, the people to working uh, with a lot of the data and always in the field. And so uh, less communication with the public with the people always communicate with the very very uh, uh, government uh, service and the universities and also the uh, the some some this kind of professional people. So that's why maybe people know very little about our our job. Of course, we also have the geologists working for the resources. Like right now, due to the pandemic, you will see the price of all the, all the raw materials become very, very high, especially for a lot of European countries. The, the, uh, the, the natural gas become very uh, big issues for, uh, for many, many countries. Uh, also, uh, we are looking for the solution for the climate. So the, we need to looking for more, more clean energies, like the breathing energy, the natural gas is the breathing energy. So we need to looking for more green energy. So this is our job also. So this is uh, some jobs from our side. So to contribute to the societies uh, for, for uh, of course, we are looking for more uh, collaboration with you and to make more work. We have very big group, very interesting. We have very big group of the artists in our uh, our community and in, uh, in our field. So, but for the journalists, uh, for the media, we, we didn't do too much. So hope uh, in the next days we have more communicate. Yeah. Thank you, Meng. So I guess the best solution for that is that we're going to have the Asian version of Jurassic Park, maybe. So <laughs> maybe Nina, Jeff, if you have any contact, just shoot it to Meng. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's move to Nina. I, I have one question from the audience. So um, what can you suggest that we do um, to prepare for the next possible crisis, like the current pandemic issues in terms of media? Uh, since you have an experience working with media students and also the media itself, uh, what do you think that we need to prepare? Hey, so uh, for this, uh, thank you for this question. And um, uh, I have to share with you just uh, one year ago, I, st I was still um, a, a student, like um, studying my master course and um, the pandemic just came to me like a present <laughs> that I didn't want. <laughs> but um, you know what, that's that the, 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 the chance for me to practice a lot when I having the course during the um, pandemic time. Um, so uh, I, I will tell you how, how it changed for me when I learned. So uh, for uh, in a daily routine, uh, if I'm uh, in, in like a normal daily I will go out to see people, uh, to interview people, and then we, we, we're going to make like um, a, a full um, news, TV news for every day um, in, in my class. But then when the pandemic came, we cannot do that again. Uh, we, uh, we could not do it um, one, uh, anymore. And then we have to uh, think of um, substitution, ways to change in, in the way of uh, giving news and uh, reporting news. So we, we uh, met a lot of difficulties. Uh, instead of just going out to see people, now we have to call more people. Uh, we have to receive more uh, like, um, no, we. I don't want to. I don't. I don't know who you are. So I. I need to find this peop. This person. Then introduce me to another person. I. I learned how to um, broaden my network uh, in an efficient way to use um, uh, for my uh, my job to uh, to reporting news. Uh, and I. Um, I think one the biggest thing that we have to prepare for the next bad thing that uh, will come to us without notice um, that sometime we need to accept that we uh, we have to accept it um, firstly when uh, when we have the pandemic and we cannot go out to get the in the normal interview anymore a lot of my um, my classmates like uh, studying with me they they were like very angry they they just um, don't want to to keep going and keep studying some of them dropped and uh, they say that it's not uh, it's not the perfect condition for me to learn now but um you know sometimes when in in the in the imperfects 
condition they can uh, it can help you to sharpen your skill and help you to uh, have some more skill that you never heard that you uh, never thought that you will have so um, I think my lesson is to learn how to accept and learn how to adapt uh, instead of uh, uh, hoping that it will not come so sometimes we have to accept that you know, we cannot do anything with this situation and we have to find another way to to innovate and to uh, do things in a different way. We talk a lot about the, um, the, the phrases of uh, new ways of working now. We have agile way of working, now we have new way of tackling problems. Yeah, I think now we, we, we have to innovate ourselves, change our mind in uh, every, every day. I think every every day. Yeah. Thank you for your question. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's def that's definitely answering the question. Uh, thank you, Nina. Maybe you can have a little bit of your uh, opinion, Jeff, since you're also working in media. What do you think is the next thing that we need to prepare? Sorry, I, I, uh, I have some problem with my... Can you, you say that again? Well, that was for me. Uh, the... Uh, I'm okay. sorry, sorry, Nina. I was I was just extending this question to Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what's sorry? What was the question? <laughs> uh, the question is that uh, what, what do we need to prepare in terms of media? Uh, you know, for, uh, to 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 get ready for the next pandemic or anything, the next big thing. Uh, obviously, we need to really anticipate things. I mean, we've already had this experience, so. I think in terms of science communication, we really need to develop a lot more journalists, how to, first of all, understand the science, if we are going to be the conduit to sort of, you know, bring the information to the masses, we also have to understand it. So I think a lot of collaboration from scientists and storytellers, and, and this, and it doesn't even have to be a journalist, it could be a fiction writer, someone uh, who does songs or music, you know, artists. Um, we can clearly communicate science through so many different mediums, I think. So I think by bridging that, there's a, there's a gap between scientists and um, conveyors of these stories. So I, I think if we bridge that gap through trainings and through partnerships, through conferences like this, I mean, I'm super interested in like talking about dinosaurs with Meg and how to, you know, to bring it to more people. I think um, we really just have to solidify um, collaboration and uh, again more more chances and opportunities for us to be able to discuss these things uh, and how to really make science cool you know definitely thanks Jeff for that opinion so I think we have final question today so this is for Kulsum so obviously you've been one of the key um, agent of influence to drive changes for sustainability and climate change. And, you know, I, me, myself, as a climate advocate, I salute your work and everything. So I would like to ask you, um, what is your tips in, you know, influencing the young minds on communicating the climate science, the carbon dioxide, the greenhouse effects and everything? What, did, what are your tips? What are your narrative when you talk to these young people? First, um, the first thing that I, I really truly believe is you need to lead by example. So a lot of my friends who would come to my house and you know we'd be cooking together, they'd always see I had a different bin for composting. And believe it or not, that kind of led a chain reaction. And quite a few of my friends compost now. And you know, whenever we're out at dinners and stuff, you know, they they just feel one day I was at my friend's house and I didn't know that she had a compost bin so I threw it in the regular trash can she's like no don't throw it there throw it in the right bin and I was really impressed I was like wow I really you know made that impact in one person or many people's lives and and that itself is such a good feeling when you know that you know what what you believe in you helped someone else believe in the right thing in that the right science of it as well so first of all is um you know, and this has already been covered by all three of them. Uh, Jeff, uh, Nina, and Wang have already said it, but I'll just tie it up. Number one, you know, um, make it interesting, right? That is really important. You need to be 
use their lingo, be as cool as them and be as woke as them. <laughs> so the young people, you have to speak like them. You have to speak to them in their language. Um, number two, uh, we have to lead by example, which I've already said, but I think first, you know, you speak in their language, two, lead by example, and three, you know, um, just kind of involve them in whatever way you can. So there always needs to be a call to action. If you're even talking about something. So for instance, if I'm doing a marine life, um, you know, awareness month, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everybody scuba diving. And then we're going to do that marine life um, awareness month because without that fun element, people aren't going to care. You need to go, you need to see the fish right beside you. When we were in the boat, I knew that some people were there who were kind of, you know, throwing their trash in the ocean during that awareness campaign before we started the journey. And at the end of it, everybody had their, you know, uh, garbage bags tied up and everybody's just like, don't throw anything ever again. <laughs> you know, so, so that one trip changed their lives, hopefully. Maybe if, if there was 20 people on each trip, 10 might implement it. So you really need to take them out there. You need, really need to help them have fun, but also learn at the same time. That, that's what's worked so far with me. <laughs> so I hope that helps. Thank you, Gulson. So thanks for the idea. Now, Meng, I have an idea for you. So maybe we should go dinosaur hunting the next time. Let's, let's follow you and find all these fossils around the world. So um, yeah, thank you for attending this panel. Um, this is the second plenary for this conference. We have two more days of the conference, which is going to happen next week and also the following week on Saturday. Um, I would love to extend this conversation, but we, we are so running out of time and I'm pretty sure there's a lot more stories to, behind this. You know, um, I'm pretty sure we have other, um, you know, stories about journalism from Nina and Jeff and also the, the stories um, as a scientist from Wang and also, um, you know, as an activist from Kulsum. So, uh, but the main three things that I learned today is that the first one is humanizing science, which is something that has been um, very, very rare for us because, um, you know, as a scientist myself, we tend to just want to prove whether the hypothesis is correct or not, um, rather than thinking about whether the research or the experiment is beneficial for human or for your next person or not. And the second one is to be able to communicate science in a language that other people can understand. Um, a lot of time, uh, scientists tend to use jargons and these are the things that actually deter from, you know, getting everyone interested in learning about science. So the next thing we need to do as a scientist or as an expert is to really talk about the language, uh, you know, in, in the language that people understand. And, uh, you know, uh, using colors, using visuals, using everything, those are the most important things that you need to, you know, um, use when communicating science. I think one of the best example is when you read about Martin Luther Jr. King, uh, King uh, speeches, when he used adjectives and everything in his speeches to actually get everyone emotions pump up the moment he talks about, you know, um, fighting about you know, independence and so on. And finally, is that you always need to validate your information. And I feel like I couldn't emphasize that in the, in the age of infodemics, validity is very, very important. We have chain text messages going everywhere in our WhatsApp, in our Telegram, in our whatever text messages that you're using. So um, validating your news is very important. And I feel that uh, we shouldn't just limit this action of validating news to journalism, but also as, as a reader, we need to always uh, validate whatever information that coming on our way is uh, true before we spread it out to other people. So I guess thanks everyone for contributing to this plenary. It is such a pleasure uh, talking to each and every one of you. And I think everyone have to keep smiling because someone is taking a screenshot of us now. Um, 
but I don't know, I don't have the cue, but uh, I just want to let everyone that I, I really appreciate this session. So um, I'll pass it back to you, Prof Ramon.